Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you succeed in your GCSE. This lesson, Transformers. This topic was suggested by Kiana Abriana, James Smith, Zach Eunice, It's Lucy, Jai Chandra, Ella Grace Gregoire, Zach Alsop and George Bonney. Thanks guys. If you've got a topic which you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. Here's something most people don't know about electromagnetism. Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted, and yes, I did have to look up how to pronounce his name, he discovered the link between electricity and magnetism totally by accident. Let me show you how. Here's a double A cell, a piece of wire, and a compass pointing to magnetic north. Connecting the two ends of the cell with the piece of wire causes a current to start flowing. And when it does, the compass moves. And for that, people have to look up how to pronounce your name on YouTube 200 years later. Pretty simple, right? Before we go any deeper into this, here's a quick reminder of a few of the things you probably already saw in Year 7 or Year 8. Firstly, magnets have a magnetic field around them, and we represent that field with field lines. Also, a couple of terms which you need to be aware of. Remember that potential difference just means voltage. It's pretty much the same thing. GCSE examiners in particular care about you using the term potential difference though. So anytime I use the phrase potential difference, it just means voltage. A couple of other things. Remember that a conductor is something which allows an electrical current to move really easily through it. And an electrical current is just a flow of electrons. So in the case of the cell we just looked at, those electrons are flowing from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. Any time that we put a conductor in between those two sides, as I just did. So as we can see, electricity and magnetism are linked. If you change the electrical current, then you cause a magnetic field. But the reverse is true as well. If you move a conductor, and that can be any conductor, through a magnetic field, then you can induce an electrical current. So to put that another way, if we cut field lines with a conductor, that just means move that conductor through a magnetic field, then we induce a current. We cause electrons in that conductor to start flowing. And we'll induce a potential difference between either end of the conductor as well. Coiling a conductor like this can increase the effect. And so you can move a coil across a magnet or through a magnetic field and you will get some current out. Sometimes though, it's a lot easier to move the magnet instead. This is induction. With a constantly changing magnetic field, we induce a potential difference across the ends of the coil and we induce a current to start flowing in the coil. This is a simple electrical generator, and all generators work on this principle. Transformers rely on the same principle, but instead of waving a magnet around to get that changing magnetic field, what they use is an electromagnet. An electromagnet is just a coil of wire with a current going through it. Quite often we'll put an iron core through the middle as well. Uh, you probably saw that again in year seven or year eight and it just makes the electromagnet stronger. You don't need to worry why it makes it stronger. You just need to know that putting an iron core inside it increases the strength of any electromagnet. So we've got an electromagnet here, and this, when we apply a DC current, generates a magnetic field, similar to the magnetic field we saw before. Here's the really clever bit. At the moment, this electromagnet is using a DC supply. That's direct current. It just flows in one direction all the time. Instead of using that, what we can do is use an alternating current. That's an AC supply. And if we use an AC supply, then the current is constantly flowing back and forth instead. It's a little like the tide coming in and going back out again. As this happens, the poles of our magnet flip and they flip in step with this constantly changing current. And so we get a constantly changing magnetic field. And remember, constantly changing magnetic fields are what we need for induction. If you've just got a, a stationary magnetic field, then you don't induce any current at all. But a changing magnetic field, that's when you can induce some current. So by using an AC supply in our electromagnets, we get the constantly changing current we can use for induction. All we've got to do is put another coil next to this constantly changing electromagnet and we will induce a current in it. And so that's exactly what we do do. In fact, the symbol for a transformer actually represents this. We've got a coil on the left. That's our input coil. We call that the primary coil, just because it's the first one. It's the one that the electricity goes into. 
and we've got the coil on the right there. That's our secondary coil, and that's the one we get the electricity back out of. And quite often, we'll use an iron core. So this bar in the middle just represents that iron core, which makes our transformer here more efficient. And these are very, very efficient devices. The changing current in the primary coil causes a changing magnetic field, which induces a current in the secondary coil. That's all that a transformer really is. You've just got that changing field which induces a current. Now an important thing to notice is that the primary coil and the secondary coil are not connected electrically. There is no electrical connection between them, it's just that magnetic connection between them. And so this can make them quite useful for isolating electrical supplies. A good example of this is for a shaver outlet in a bathroom. Shaver outlets will have exactly this sort of setup behind them so that there's not normally any current flowing from the shaver outlets. It's isolated, so it's not connected directly to the mains. We can use this for more than just isolating electrical supplies for safety though. There's another useful property of transformers, and that depends on how many turns there are on each coil. If there are twice as many turns on the secondary coil, we get twice the potential difference induced across it. If there are three times as many turns on the secondary coil, then we get three times the induced potential difference. So if we are putting in a potential difference of 10 volts, for example, and we've got a thousand turns on the primary coil, and we've got 5,000 turns on the secondary coil, then we've got five times as many turns on that secondary coil, and so we'll get five times the potential difference, which in this case is just 50 volts. There is an equation which shows this relationship. I really wouldn't spend too much time worrying about that equation, no. All you need to remember is if you've got five times as many turns on the secondary coil, then you have five times the potential difference coming out. A transformer which increases the potential difference in this way is known as a step-up transformer because it steps up the potential difference, it increases it. These are used in a national grid to increase the potential difference after it's come from the power stations, after it's been generated. It's much more efficient to distribute electricity at very, very high potential differences. And I'll explain why in just a sec. At the other end though, these very high potential differences are dangerous. They can arc very easily through the air. You wouldn't want to use them in your home. And so the potential difference has to be stepped back down again. We use a step down transformer to reduce the potential difference to safer levels. So for example, if we have a 200 volt input potential difference there, and we've got 6,000 turns on our primary coil, and we have only 600 turns on our secondary coil, well then we've got a ratio of 10 to one. So we're going to step down the potential difference in exactly the same ratio. If there's one tenth as many turns on our secondary coil, then we get one tenth the potential difference out. So in this case, one tenth of 200 is 20. Try not to overthink this. All you're looking at is how many times bigger or smaller that secondary coil is compared to the primary one. If it's 100 times bigger, then you get 100 times the potential difference. Alternatively, if it's 1,000th the size of the primary, then you get 1,000th the potential difference out. It really is that simple. So how does a transformer make the distribution of electricity more efficient? Well, it all comes down to this equation, P equals I times V. That is power equals current multiplied by potential difference. The amount of power you put into a transformer is always pretty much the same as the amount of power you get back out of a transformer. In truth, it does actually lose a little bit of energy via things like heat and sound, but only a very tiny amount. So at this level, you can just assume that you're getting 100% of the power back out. So if you put 1000 watts in, you're going to be getting 1000 watts back out. But you're changing the potential difference. So if you've made the potential difference much bigger, but you can't change the amount of power, you have a fixed amount of power, then to compensate for that, the current has to be much smaller. And this is the really clever thing, that as the potential difference increases through a transformer, as you step up that potential difference, you're actually stepping down the current by the same amount. So big potential differences which we use to distribute electricity have very, very low current. 
And this is important because as current flows through a wire, be that a wire on your desk or an electricity cable, as it flows through that, it heats the wire and it loses some energy as it does that. If you've got less current flowing, then you lose less energy due to heating those cables. And as you can imagine, if your electricity cables are hundreds of kilometers long, you want to have as little current flowing in there and as little energy lost due to heating as you possibly can, because that's a lot of distance over which that heating will be happening. So the transformer increases the potential difference and reduces the current at the same time. And so it wastes far less energy when you're distributing the electricity. And again, at the other end, we need to step it back down to a safe level to use in our homes. And so the opposite process takes place. The potential difference coming back out is much smaller, and so the current is much bigger. One final thing which you need to know about is switch mode transformers. The sorts of transformers which we use to change potential differences in the national grid are very, very large. But you also use transformers in your home. For example, this mobile phone charger is a transformer, and this is a switch mode transformer. It takes the electricity supply from the mains, which is 230 volts here in the UK, and it steps it down to a much lower potential difference so that it's safe to charge a mobile phone. A traditional transformer relies on the alternating current to generate that constantly changing magnetic field, which is needed to induce the current in the secondary coil. A switch mode transformer like this uses electronic switching to do the same thing, essentially switching the power supply on and off very, very rapidly. And when I say very rapidly, I'm talking about between 50 kilohertz, that's 50,000 hertz, that's 50,000 times a second, and up to even 200 kilohertz. And that is what induces the current in the secondary coil. Now there are big advantages to this. Obviously, instead of a huge chunk of iron with a load of windings wrapped around it, we've got a very small light device. They tend to be relatively cheap as well. And the other big advantage is that if they're connected to the power supply, but you don't have anything connected to the other end because you're not charging your mobile phone, then these are very, very low power. They draw almost no power when you don't have a phone charging on them. So two big advantages for switch mode transformers. I hope that video really helped you. To see what else I can help you with, there's lots more videos to check out on my channel. Scroll down the main page there to see I've already sorted them into playlists to help you find the video you need. You can also check out my revision guides, which cover everything you need to know for the exam. They feature links to my videos, revision tips, cover both foundation and higher tier, and unlike a lot of revision guides, they also point out what you don't need to waste time learning. If you want to check your learning, try the Snap Quiz website and app, which allow you to identify which areas you need to spend the most time learning. Remember, this is the only YouTube channel which brings you the teachers, the textbooks, and the tests all on your terms, on mobile phone, tablet, or computer for you to revise when you want and how you want, even immediately before you go into the exam. All of these links and any others for this video will be down in the description. Lastly, it really does help my channel if you want to leave likes, if you subscribe, or if you know someone else who's having trouble, tell them to search for Mr. Thornton. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.